Sun Organics is an indie beauty line. We only deal with natural and organic ingredients and the end result is to give the African woman very healthy, gorgeous crown that she can be proud of. So growing up, I didn't see myself as an entrepreneur. Consistency. You can't afford, today I'm, I'm here, I'm available, I'm doing it. Tomorrow, oops, I don't feel like doing this thing. <laughs> Bye, sorry. Show up every day. Sun Organics is uh, an indie beauty line, very niche. Uh, we only deal with natural and organic ingredients. What I mean by this is uh, we only source for healthy ingredients that we're gonna formulate and the end result is to give the African woman very healthy, gorgeous crown that she can be proud of. The inspiration behind Sarah Organics happened when my four-year-old daughter then, she was going to join kindergarten. And of course, as a young mother, you're happy your child is going to school. Only that, for her to start getting very serious bouts of flu that would make her miss school, you know, and the bouts of flu are so severe, like the fever would go really high. She's weak, you're holding her, and they're thinking she's supposed to be playing out. And you know, kids do not pretend. They do not have the energy to be outside and play. They don't. They'll just, you know, stay there. And it was frustrating. It was becoming a cycle of me going to the hospital, getting antibiotics, coming back. And at one time I was wondering how many antibiotics am I really giving this young child? And I don't think I was even taking that many antibiotics as an adult. So that, that whole process was frustrating and not settling well in my heart. And uh, I can remember back then I had a, a PhD student who was a neighbor and uh, she told me, do you know about Moringa? And I was like, uh, what, what about Moringa? She's like, if you give your child Moringa tea, you'll never visit the hospital again and you can be assured she'll be able to go to school consistently. So I gave it a shot. I went to one of the shops got moringa powder, came, tried the mixing of the tea, added a bit of lemon and honey to give it a taste, and I gave it to my baby. I think I did this like in the evening, and of course uh, we slept, and then the following day I woke up, checked on her, then went to work. But now coming back from work the following day, the child was outside playing, and I was thinking, wait, a day ago, I was carrying you from uh, your, from the couch to the bed. I know, and you know, she's screaming. She's all over the place, and I'm like, "What magic is happening here?" And that aroused my curiosity. What did this moringa do? You know, and I went on big research on it and found it's such an amazing immune booster. So what it did, it made the child be able to fight. The infection and everything in her body and now she was strong she was back at it she was she was just this healthy child that curiosity uh was enhanced when during that december I went to my shards that in taitata veta and realized this moringa tree actually grows in my backyard i didn't even know you know i only thought it's something i'm buying from supermarket only to realize wow my farmers back at home actually plant the tree but then I was discouraged when I realized they actually don't see the benefits of the tree. For them, they wanted to see more than just the nutrition bit. Of course, there's the old story about uh, mothers can eat and enhance their breastfeeding. Uh, the leaves are very nutritious. They can be used as part of, uh, you know, mboga, what we call in Kiswahili mboga. And that's good, but they wanted money bit of it. Like, can we sell this particular crop that we are planting and get money out of it? And that's the bit most of the local farmers are not getting. And hearing their story and knowing so well what this Moringa has done for me and my child, I think they couldn't just rest on it. So coming back to Nairobi after their short vacation, I start, I start, I think I was just wondering, how can I help this farmer? How can I be of use of help to this farmer? So at first I thought maybe I should start selling the Moringa seeds. <laughs> then I realized uh, people don't even like the taste. It can be a little bit interesting. It's an acquired taste as much as it's that nutritious. Or do I start doing the powder thing and sell as tea, just like the one we're selling as tea? But that didn't feel 
very sustainable to the levels that we wanted. And so Mkamboy, what did she do? Went back to research and realized another secret about it. It's an amazing beauty ingredient that has been used so many years, especially in India when they're making their skincare products and their hair care products. And one of the biggest element is how moisturizing its properties can be, especially from their seed oil. They have something called behenic. That behenic uh, is one of the most natural occurring moisturizing ingredients. And at Moringa seed oil, it's at 47%, the highest ever you can find in a natural source and that was it for me i was like bingo what do I, what do we lack everybody's like dry hair dry skin dry what like here's the ingredient i need to see how i can explore further i think at the time that i was uh, i was uh, having the dreams of sarogonics and it coming to you know be established and being officially launched in the market something very interesting was happening in my life back then I was actually doing my MBA and in MBA you're supposed to do this uh, project and I actually used that opportunity to you know to do Sarogonics as a project in itself and so I had the help of the lecturer you know guiding me from market research all the way to the business plan to the financial plan it's like <laughs> it's like the course itself for Sarogonics and the beauty about it, uh, my, my professor was very, very, very helpful. He actually loved the idea and he was making sure, make sure you make this thing a real thing. It's just not ending <laughs> here on the paper. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we are, we are on it, we are on it. So my MBA really, and I did MBA finance, really helped me in that aspect. And also it's the time I met my partner, uh, Emmanuel Asuma. We, we actually worked together on this and made it made it uh, a reality so yes but right now i'm back to school because now uh the mba that could help me with the whole administration finance projections and it has helped us grow organically can i tell you you've never had the kind of funding people usually say like we received a loan or cg series f funding or early stage funding we've not had that we've actually grown organically that takes a lot of discipline and I, I, I would credit uh, my MBA background on it and of course my awesome partner who actually is the financial the financial planner in this organization in my I'd credit that to him but now when it comes to formulation it was very self-taught uh, I, would, uh, I would approach other formulators and ask them so how does this and this work together the good thing I think I'm very quick at getting stuff so I would be able to see the chemistry behind it and be like ah okay read so much on my own as well but right now I'm currently enrolled in one of the best schools for formulation uh, it's called formula botanica from UK I'm doing it online an international diploma the early days of Saru organics uh, were pretty humble pretty modest started uh, in my mom's kitchen because uh, uh, back then I was still living in, with my with my mom and um, I was just doing the, the, the you know the, the small the small experiments in the kitchen in fact I can remember she used to be telling me just wait to finish cooking then you do your things <laughs> because she used to look at them like a mess you know you've come with clay and you're like you're making clay shampoo you've come with several oils and you're trying to mix all this all these oils and all that thing so it started from that modest background of just using very simple kitchen tools a double boiler a, the small bain marie a whisk uh, the one uh, the mixer the hand mixer that you use for cake mixing in fact sometimes she was like no get yours because now we can't <laughs> we cannot share <laughs> this one and all and uh, the the thing is uh with time she saw how serious i am my dad was like ain't this even illegal you bringing all, all these types of oils in our kitchen and making them and this is a house is this you know like my dad was like ain't this not illegal what you what you are doing and uh, when they realized i'm not I'm not stopping, I'm, I'm at it. My mom was like, okay, so what do you need? I was like, let me finish the business plan and then I'll let you know what I actually need. So she was gracious enough um, to, uh, to actually invest 
in the company and Maki she had not seen what you're seeing. <laughs> she had not seen this jazz. She was seeing very mediocre kind of packaging, but a very determined girl. I think that's what she saw. Very, very determined girl. So she was able to convince her brother who is my uncle to invest in the company. And by then I'd now finished the MBA plan, business plan, and I had an idea where we are going. And with them investing, uh, the little that they invested, I was able now to do something better. Like I would buy packaging materials, like good bottles. I could have good labels. I could afford uh, to start a uh, you know the social media pages it started very simple with just social media pages we didn't go really far and then eventually my partner came on board Emmanuel he was also convinced of this thing that I'm creating and after taking the products to one of his sister and the sister liking them I think he was like okay if, if my sister said this is good stuff I can believe in you and so together we started and we still did it from home that's still in that kitchen for almost a year we still did it from the house for almost a year. That time my selling point was pop-up market. The famous one was called K1 Free Market. By, uh, it used to be run by Kaz, Karen Kaz, uh, a musician. She's in the entertainment space. And it would allow me to interact with customers directly because you just came you have your table you set up your shampoos your stuff and then people would come and be like what is this what is a clay shampoo and i'd be like this is how it works it makes sure it not only cleanses your hair conditions your hair leaves your hair soft so you don't have to worry about after that i have to condition again because people had been told after shampoo condition i'm like no i can get you a shampoo that leaves your hair soft and conditioned and so people are liking the the innovation, the new thing that, that, that I'm bringing about. And my lucky break, I think, came when uh, one of the ladies uh, who came to that K1 free market happened to work with uh, a big brand that was Ethnic Shop. And she was like, your things should be on the shelf. They look really, really good. Do you have everything? And I was like, yeah. Uh, I managed to get kebs. Uh, that's the match I think I had at that particular time. From that lady who visited K1 loving our product and she had these shops, Ethnic. Uh, the Ethnic brand was at Sarit Center, uh, Adlife Plaza, Garden City, and the one Naivasha, Buffalo Malls. And just like that, Saro Organics was on this four malls and by us being on the malls it's like god was introducing us to the client that we are actually targeting the cl client who is very conscious about the ingredients that they use and they're ready to spend good money for their value we launched sarah organics officially june 2017 that's what uh the government books would tell you but of course uh, I'd started working on it my, my, my MBA had started in September 2015 so around 2016 all along <laughs> I was busy working on this Star Organics uh, dream and all that but officially 2017 we were recorded as an established company incorporated and ready to operate on Kenyan soil uh, of course we were uh, still at my mom's home but uh, what happened during that time though they started having rumors that you need to have a manufacturing license and that manufacturing license can't be at a home setup and we are being forced to get into workshops into warehouses or into places that have designated for that kind of work either an industrial park or a commercial center like it was just coming i think from KRA actually and of course I was uh, hot on my heels to look for a place but uh, in Nairobi because that's where we were living with my mom the thing is uh, the rent I, I would go I'd go to industrial area talk to those warehouses guys and someone tells me the rent is 200k the rent is 150k and I'm thinking that would be my entire revenue for the month. I mean, what will I be left with if I'll just be paying all that cash? And then again, the, the minimum space they are, they are about to give you, it seems so, so big, and you haven't yet gained that big traction in the market. So you're like, all this space, I don't even 
need it. I just, I just need like a, one room <laughs> and I'll be set up. And so that challenged me and I was thinking, so what else can I do? I can't stay at home and definitely I'm not able to afford the industrial parks and the warehouses and all that. And I thought, Mkamboy, maybe it's time to move out of Nairobi. Why don't you check other areas? Why don't you look at other areas? And the thought of actually getting out of Nairobi was scary because you know th there's that familiarity you have the raw materials are near and that kind of a thing and they're like oh my god am i going to be able to stay away from Nairobi and then i i'm already a mother you are thinking the schooling bits <laughs> how is it going to work and that but um I, I decided uh for the dream i just have to do it and so talking to friends somebody told me about ruiru you can get a bit uh, rates that are affordable it might not be near to nairobi like you want but yeah i mean you know where it hurts most and so we came to kiambu county and uh at first we uh, we, we we got a three-roomed house on its own on its own uh, standalone, like a, a standalone house, and we converted that now to both our office and our storage area and our workshop area, and it worked until now again. It it became small, and now that necessitated us now to move to our current workshop place. The growth is what was making us say, okay, this space is too small. Now we need to look for the next. And right now, even as I am looking at it, in the next two years, we are going to look for another bigger space. But it has been that kind of organic growth. And setting up here has been amazing. As an entrepreneur, I've actually taken quite a big risk, I should say. It's, it's one thing that is constant. Because you don't always have the end picture you're not so sure how it will work out you know uh, and one of the risks that you have to take is actually employing people meaning they're dependent <laughs> on you they, yes you might be a separate entity but at the end of the day it's you who scratches your head wondering where is that pay going to come from and you just realizing i need help I need, I need to hire someone, I need an assistant, I need a, a marketer, I need an administrator, I need an accountant, I need a social media person and all that. It's a whole huge risk and you're hoping these people are actually going to bring their A game. And if they fail, what you're also going to do about it. So that, that was one of the biggest risks that you have to take as an entrepreneur, especially as a young entrepreneur because it's not like you've gone for a course that prepared you for entrepreneurship this thing you just can't jump in you don't know how far deep it is or how shallow it is but that was one of the biggest risks that i had to take it and it has been a learning journey from then on i realized what i need what i do not need so like uh, right now i'm in that stage i actually tell people you've got to be someone who can multitask not just one kind of a job yeah, you know, I don't want somebody to tell me I'm only an accountant and that's the only thing I can do. Nothing else I can do. You should be that person who can also talk to customer. If my customer care manager, for example, she's on leave, doesn't mean now you can't uh, be able to serve a customer and that kind of thing. So we are pretty much um, uh, on that stage where we like to have uh, a personnel that is flexible, adaptable, very adaptable, very agile, and can learn quick on the job, which is one of the best traits you can have on a startup as an entrepreneur. The other big risk I took is going for premium ingredients. Go, it's not easy going for premium ingredients. One, because most suppliers, they rely on the big companies, the ones that are may not necessarily be doing the indie beauty, the natural and organic uh, ingredients. And so they don't find the economic sense of bringing a particular prime ingredient only to serve a very, you know, uh, small company like Cyro Organics. They feel like I want to bring, uh, if I bring like 500 kg bag, I know that one within two months, it's gone, it's cleared. Not one will be like, no, I only need 100 kg out of this and I'll come back again next year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that that aspect of deciding to go for very premium ingredients has been costly. It has been a risk. We've had issues where a supply, especially during the pandemic, 
just tells you stop bringing that ingredient the shipping cost was too much getting it in here and we are serving only three four of you it doesn't make economic sense and she's and she has stopped and there's nothing you can do about it and you've got to figure out okay now the ingredient has been stopped the supply is not coming mkamboi what are you going to do we have uh, two types of raw materials in our kind of industry that those we call raw and unrefined which is the beauty of natural ingredients because at that particular stage they are very potent it's the way they tell you like uh, uh, having cabbages or vegetables being raw and being cooked they have different nutrition value it's the same thing with our ingredients as well so the raw and refined ones happens to be very potent uh, and, and that's the reason why i tell you try avocado oil might be so different from another avocado oil because ours is cold pressed there was no heat involved and cold pressing of course is very hectic more time consuming more expensive to make it's easier when you do heating and you have your oil ready so uh that that aspect to get many from our local farmers we have here in moranga and thika the macadamia farmers and the avocado farmers our moringa oil we have farmers from taita and also kilifi we are giving us the the seeds the moringa seeds and also from kilifi and kitui we have the baobab seeds that makes for us the baobab oil so the raw and unrefined ingredients i would speak of our own local farmers that we've partnered with them through various cooperatives not uh, like farmers who have come together in a particular like in kilifi it's actually a women's kind of group so we deal with that with that group and they would get we get the baobab seeds we get the moringa seeds and that kind of a thing uh then there are those other products that uh, you can necessarily get them uh, locally because um, this industry has grown much better in the uk in the australia in the america and so they've managed to get what you'd call um a, a, a preservative that can be used for natural ingredients an emulsifier that can be used uh, on natural ingredients and so those ones we have to source abroad so some suppliers source for us and others we actually have to just source directly from us so when you say it's sulfate free it's true because we've gone that extra mile to get that surfactant as a non-sulfate when you say it's paraben free yes we've gone that extra mile where a paraben would probably cost you maybe something like 200 shillings a liter here you have a preservative that is costing you 2500 a liter you can see the the they're not on the same stage one thing that i would tell uh one or two things that i would tell uh, aspiring entrepreneurs young entrepreneurs coming up prayer works i've had situations where i can tell you that was just prayer consistency you can't afford today i'm i'm here i'm available i'm doing it tomorrow oops i don't feel like doing this thing <laughs> bye sorry show up every day show up every day not unless there's something very um you know something very uh stressful or whatever it is that needs you out and not being able to work that you're not don't stand alone yes i know in the beginning we are all one man show i was a one man show <laughs> you know doing social media marketing messenger everything production but it was so tiring it was making me so gloomy it was making me dull and all but the moment you realize you can work with that team and i know we are scared about payment that's the first thing like what you let pay them with talk to someone talk sell your vision to that person let them see what you're bringing the table if they buy that vision they can come work with you my one of my employees here lucia actually started with how well i was formulating even before <laughs> before the business had been established or incorporated i was with lucia we were working together during those formulation areas today she's our customer care person in the company she started as a volunteer back then we were like let's go sell then i'll give you the commission from the sales <laughs> you know there was nothing like at the end of the month i'll give you salary but because i sold to her the idea i sold to her the vision she was okay with that so don't be that one person find a team find two three people that you can stand with that you can work with and if they if you're not able to sell a vision to two three people how are you going to sell it to customers who don't know you